Hi, I'm Joe Roth. At New Jersey Sharing Network, we're committed to saving and enhancing people's lives through organ and tissue donation and informing people about our life-saving mission. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. The latest in cancer treatment next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Resources, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Berkeley College, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, and by MagnaCare. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey, and by Commerce Magazine. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. What exactly is proton therapy and how could it be used to treat cancer? Here to help us understand the possibilities of this interesting treatment, we have Claire Granger Valvano, who is an oncology social worker at Cancer Care. Dr. Atif Khan, medical director at the Lori Proton Therapy Center at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital. Dr. Michael Stubblefield, who is Medical Director of Cancer Rehabilitation at the Kessler Institute for Rehabilitation. And finally, Eric Gonzalez, who recently received proton therapy. I want to thank you all for joining us. You know, when I first heard about this proton therapy, I was like, first of all, it's a fascinating name. Second of all, it's the latest um, treatment for cancer therapy. How is it different from what's been done before, doctor? So uh, proton therapy is a form of radiation therapy. And essentially what we're trying to do, or the name of the game for us as radiation oncologists, is to get a high or let's say curative dose of radiation to the tumor while sparing the surrounding uh, normal structures that may be around that tumor. So give me an example. So for example, you can have a tumor that, let's say a brain tumor or a tumor um, at the skull base structures, uh, that tumor might actually be wrapped around, say, the optic nerve, which is the nerve that carries our vision back to our brain. Right. We want to give a high and curative dose of radiation to that tumor while protecting that optic nerve. That's obviously a critical, critical structure. Uh, and so we have developed many ways of de delivering precise radiation therapy. And proton therapy is one way of delivering, again, this uh, targeted radiotherapy. Uh, it offers some very distinct advantages in terms of how this radiation dose is delivered. For example, like what specific uh, benefit? So for example, and actually this is probably the critical thing, proton ther protons as they enter a structure or say a body. What is a proton? So a proton, great question. I, I, I mean, I'm like. Great I, question. I thought I knew, then I read and I go, that's a proton? I didn't know, go ahead. Go ahead. Great question. Protons are one of the elemental forces in our universe. It's one of the first, it was, it, uh, the first particle that came into existence right after the Big Bang. Uh, and they're everywhere, they're in all, all of the different, uh, uh, they're, they're literally everywhere. And the fact that we can harness these particles for the treatment of cancer is you know, a technological marvel, really. Uh, what we're doing with protons is we can accelerate them to a very high speed and then aim them very carefully at a certain part of the body to treat these tumors. Uh, that is a little bit different from x-ray therapy or conventional photon therapy. That's photon. That's photon therapy. That's really the type of radiation therapy that most people are familiar with. Right. Uh, if you know someone who had treatment for their prostate cancer or their breast cancer, they've probably got x-ray therapy or photon therapy. And x-ray therapy or photon therapy is a lot like the chest x-rays or dental x-rays that people get for diagnostic purposes. But doesn't proton therapy, as opposed to photon therapy, doesn't proton therapy go deeper? It, well, not that it goes deeper, but we can uh, drive them to a certain depth in the body and then get them to stop at that depth. And this really is the critical difference between photons and protons. And because they will behave that way, because they will stop at a certain depth, we can spare all of that exit wow. dose beyond that depth. Now, you're shaking your head. Eric. Yes. Now, you, your, your story. I'm reading a story going into this show saying I cannot believe 
this guy has gone through this, and he's got that smile on his face. Take, get the camera off me. <laughs> you, 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 you should do a seminar. You should do a show itself on PBS just on having a great attitude. Mm -hmm. Tell folks about your experience and then ultimately how you wound up being treated with proton therapy. Sure. Um, last summer, um, I was diagnosed with, uh, with uh, a tumor that was uh, enveloped on, on my spinal cord. So uh, basically it was uh, contained within my thoracic and lumbar spine. So the uh, initial treatment uh, I received was, uh, you know, surgery to remove those, the, the tumor. Uh, I had a series of two surgeries plus rehabilitation to, uh, you know, recover from those surgeries. How long had the tumor been growing? Um, the estimate that I was given was anywhere between 10 and 15 years. 10 and 15 years? Yeah. And Any I, impact on your life? Well, I, I lived during that time with a lot of chronic back pain. Uh, and the way that I kind of became alert that things were getting worse was my lower extremity started to get numb. So I went to my doctor and, you know, it, it, it elevated, you know, escalated from How there. How did you sleep? Uh, barely. <laughs> barely. I had to sleep upright, you know, in a chair, um, you know, uh, in a recliner. I couldn't lay down flat at all. Chronic pain? Immense chronic pain. Ten years? At least. Okay, so you had the surgery. Yes. Talk about the proton therapy. So following the surgery, you know, I, I went through, you know, my physical recovery, uh, and then it came time to discuss treatment options. So my biggest concern was, you know, being 40 years old, you know, my biggest concern was that uh, I, I didn't want uh, to undergo anything that might be, might lead to additional cancer, additional problems with my body. Uh, so I kind of had a, I, w I was very concerned about that. And I was leaning towards perhaps not having any, you know, uh, radiation therapy at all. But after meeting with my doctors and they explained to me what was available with the proton therapy, and they explained to me uh, exactly what uh, Dr. Khan, uh, you know, talked about, about controlling the protons and, and uh, uh, allowing, uh, you know, uh, them to be concentrated in the area that needs to be concentrated on and not spread out right. uh, to the other areas. That made me feel much better, much more confident uh, as to, you know, as far as like the success and the, and the future of my health. There's a lot, there's a rehab piece here, doctor. There's an emotional, psychological piece, go and then go. Yeah, so, you know, as I hear your story, can I ask first what kind of tumor it was? Um, it was a pendomoma. An appendomoma, that's what right. I thought it was gonna be, yeah. So, you know, these are slow growing indolent tumors that don't usually metastasize. So they don't usually spread to oh, other yeah, parts yeah. of the body. Indolent meaning? A very slowly growing. As, as he said. So the, meaning it doesn't. It wouldn't usually go to the bone or go to the okay. lungs or go to go the ahead. brain, not usually. So they're very, we say insidious, slow growing, you know, they're really just a terrible tumor. And it, just like that, they, they grow for a long time. And this one sounds like was probably traconus at the very end of your spinal cord, I'm guessing. Yes. Right, so that's where all of the nerves come off, what we call the cauda equina, the horse's tail. These are the nerves that go down and spread out to the rest of your body. They also work things like bowel and bladder, sexual, function. So all of those they can are, wreak havoc. They can wreak havoc. Um, so that is sort of standard, you know, because they're so insidious, right? Because they tend to grow even after they, we resect them, they can come back um, and often do come back. You want the radiation therapy to sort of halt it. And, and there's three sort of basic ways we would give radiation in this situation. One's conventional where we just kind of front to back radiation, unfortunately, and that the spinal cord and the nerve roots, everything are in the way. Then we do these sort of radio surgery techniques where we right. use the same photons, right, but we sculpt it around the, the cord so that we try to minimize, as you said, right. you know, the, the level of collateral damage. And then there's these, you know, now proton therapy, which, you know, if you think of regular radiation as being a bullet, whereas when it hits something, then it slows down, right? So you have a higher dose at the mm -hmm. surface and then less later. You think of, I think of, and I think very yeah, simplistically. That's, that's, actually a good, that's a good way to think of it. Right, I, I think of the proton therapy's depth charges. 
depth right. depth charges like from a from like trying to sink a u-boat right so you it drops in the water say or in your body and then it explodes so it, it doesn't have a lot of energy here the energy is sort of stored and when it gets to your target depth if you're trying to sink a submarine that might be 200 feet it might be 500 feet when it gets there Okay, but it delivers say, the say it works relatively well, or mm -hmm. works well. Why would you need rehab? Well, because you have several issues at play here. One's the original tumor. It's been growing for a long time. It's mm -hmm. been surrounding all the nerves. It's been damaging them. I, you know, we haven't, you know, I, I don't know all the potential of your impairments, but I know all the potential impairments. So patients may have trouble walking. They may have chronic pain. They may have trouble sensing their feet. Right. Um, they may have trouble sitting for a long time. They may have um, problems with urination, right? They may have urinary retention or, or overflow. They may have trouble with their bowels. All of those sorts of things are sort of under the umbrella of rehab when you try to give comprehensive care. People need help after the surgery. Before and at, during and, and after. And, and, and boy, does this bring in a whole range of issues from a, in terms of your role. Talk about that before and after. What role do you play for the patient and his or her family? Okay, so when there's a diagnosis of cancer, it's as though someone opened up life's dresser drawer and flipped it over and all the contents are on on the ground, scattered, is every single facet of someone's life. Self, family, you friends. You're shaking his head while you're talking, go ahead. Finances, insurance, career, every single aspect of someone's life is impacted with a cancer Meaning everyone, diagnosis. Like, I thought I had everything in order. Exactly, cancer shows you that, you know what, you really, you don't know from day to day, it's here and now. Cancer's a brutal teacher. It's here Cancer's and it's Cancer is a brutal teacher, explain that. Well, it's, uh, it teaches you that we always thought we knew what would happen tomorrow, but we never really know. And it's now, it's this moment, that's what we have. And, and, and while every individual patient and his or her family deals with, thing different, deals with things differently, and every individual cancer diagnosis is different, and we're not gonna generalize here, and obviously we wish everyone who is dealing with the issue as a patient and or family member collectively, individually, we wish you nothing but the best. People need help. Do they know where to go for help? Beyond the clinical. Right, there are a lot of great resources out there and an oncology social worker can be a great first step for someone because we're trained to address the emotional yeah. and practical concerns. We can help locate great resources and there are a lot of great resources for people with cancer. We can help formulate the questions for the medical team. Right. Um, it sounds like you did that. You had your questions answered. A lot of people don't. Uh, so helping with that uh, is, is a wonderful aspect. The other thing is we can help prepare people for the cancer conversation the with cancer their family, with friends, the family. children, career, their work, their job life. Uh, doctor, talk about this. How important is this piece of it to your piece of it? Oh, it's huge. Talk about it. It is absolutely huge. Um, I, I couldn't really have, you know, it's a, that, that analogy is perfect, the dresser drawer being emptied out. And, um, you know, patients uh, have all kinds of things that are not addressed by the clinicians that there's lots of concerns and lots of care that needs to happen uh, that is really not in the domain of sort of just the science of this and the clinical trials and, you know, how we're going to do this. And um, a lot of... But you're aware of them. We're, we're, we're aware of them. We have staff uh, who are just like you who are trained uh, in oncology social work. Um, and there's lots of things that people don't think, like how is a patient going to get to the treatment center? How, you know, how are those rides going to happen? Uh, things like that that how come... About financial up, issues? Absolutely. Which creates stress. The transportation creates stress. The, 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 how you're how you going to talk about it creates stress. The money creates stress. None of that helps clinically. It, you know, to be going through all of this and then to also have to deal with that is just a huge stressor for patients. So that's a, the, the, the social um, piece of this is huge. And to have those, those trained professionals helping is, is a and big And go back deal. to the proton therapy. Mm -hmm. How much of your job, doctor, is a product of educating people about proton therapy? Um, you know, proton therapy, although it's not new, access has been very limited. There's only 15... Access is limited? There's only 15 centers in the country that have proton therapy. Insurance cover it? Insurance covers many indications, but not all. Uh, when we feel like someone is really going to benefit from proton therapy, we will advocate for them. We write letters of medical necessity. We sort of fight their case. And 
usually, you know, if there is a clear benefit to proton therapy, the insurance companies will play along and they will approve that, that treatment. Are there certain cancers that have been shown to be more responsive to proton therapy as opposed to those who are not? Absolutely. There's several indications that are considered very standard and sort of on policy even for the payers for Medicare. Uh, tumors in and around the skull base is a pretty good example. The skull base? Yeah, so at the skull base, there are many critical structures, many nerves uh, that are exiting and are critical for our function. Uh, because proton therapy is more precise and can limit this, you know, I'll call it collateral damage or this unnecessary dose going around. to the, exactly yeah. around the target. Uh, that is a well accepted indication for proton therapy. Some tumors are the eyes. Children, kids who need, some, kids get cancer, unfortunately, and some of them need radiation therapy. Uh, as you can imagine, those growing tissues are especially sensitive to the effects of this low-dose unintended radiation. Proton therapy is perfect, is ideal uh, for those pediatric indications uh, because we can really limit this unintended low-dose radiation to those to those things. Go back, go ahead, jump in. Yeah, for, for me, um, the, the 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 area of concern was from you know the middle of my body down to the end of my spine. So there were so many other, um, you know, lungs and all, you know, bowels and bladders and kidneys all in the area that, you know, preserving all that function was, was probably my, my top priority uh, in, in making the decision to, to have radiation, you know, treatment. Yeah, if I, actually, if I may just, because I think uh, Eric's case is actually very sort of illustrative of, of just the benefits of proton therapy. Just to clarify our earlier conversation, he had a pretty big tumor. It was extending from his thoracic spine. So the, uh, we have bones in our spine that are stacked up on one, mm. one another, the vertebral column, and they protect our spinal cord. The tumor was growing inside, uh, inside the spinal cord, essentially, and causing these symptoms. And it was a very big tumor. It was extending from his mid-back all the way down into his lower back. It was a, just a, you know, a very big tumor. And that's why our, our neurosurgeons did a great job. They did a staged surgical resection, meaning... Staged which is a way of saying they had to go in twice. They, it was too big for them to go in and take it out in one sitting, so they had to go in two times to sort of take out the top part and then take out the lower part. Uh, and when they were done, the, Eric was you know, relatively intact. He did have some rehabilitation needs, which he, he, he had, but he was, he was walking, he was moving his extremities. He, you know, so he was fairly intact given how big this tumor was and how extensive the surgery was. So after the two surgeries, there was some of the tumor left behind. Yeah, so there was a little bit of tumor that we could see on the MRIs. And in, in addition to that, we, just, we know that there's a risk for microscopic residual disease along that entire surgical field. And that's really, that, that entire volume is what we are trying to treat with the radiation to reduce the chance of these cells growing back and the tumor coming back. Uh, and this particular location was very sort of suitable for proton therapy because we could bring a beam in from behind, drive it down to a depth that's covering that mm. spinal uh, canal, and give essentially no dose at all beyond that to all of the structures in front of the vertebral column. The lungs, the heart, the esophagus, all of these structures got no radiation at all uh, with proton therapy. Did, did you explain, first of all, did you know enough to explain this to your family? Well, or did they explain it for you? Well. Dr. Khan and other, the other uh, technicians and nurses, they, they did a great job of explaining it. But if, if, uh, if the, what I did for myself, and I encourage other patients to do the same, is to educate themselves. Sure. Uh, you know, um, and, and not necessarily go by just anecdotal information from family and friends, like just you know, to, to actually do the research, look online, the internet's a great thing. Uh, and it's a great thing within reason, meaning you take some information and then you bring it to a medical professional. I just want to make sure that if someone just were to Google proton therapy, you get information, but it has to be peer reviewed, it has to yeah. be solid information. Uh, Can I make a point to that actually? Yeah, yes, yes, and yes. Yeah, so uh, this is actually a very important point because we have gadgets, we have devices, we have all kinds of medical advances, and oftentimes we see that the marketing gets ahead of the science. Right. And this is yeah, a yeah. big problem for, you know, uh, just our credibility as a field. And, you know, these devices are, you know, they're very expensive. People 
have mortgages to pay on these devices. Right. And like I said, the marketing often gets ahead of the science. And some right. of that marketing material is demonstra is seen online. Exactly. I just want to be and patients to that. are have will have a very hard time differentiating what is marketing and what is that's science. the only right. reason I said that is because <laughs> sure. I'm aware we, we I googled it and I saw that mm -hmm. and I was like, wait a minute, hold on. How do people make sense of it? I want to have you say something and then jump in because I want to help patients here. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, r radiation therapy in general, and I think people need to understand this, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Yep. So the fact that you've been treated with radiation, there are molecular changes that end up clogging off the small arterials and ultimately can cause damage years later. People would say, oh, well, the damage can go up to 20 years. No, it can progress indefinitely. So what we don't know because of the limited access, as we already discussed, to proton therapy is what the late effects are. So we are seeing that um, in, for selected tumors that we've studied well, the proton therapy does have a safer profile up to the point of time we've looked at it. But we need to look at it longer. Right, but, and, and, and based on sort of the theory of protons, we think it's probably gonna be safer. But so we not, still need to look at it longer. But we still need to look at it longer. There are a lot of things. Head and neck cancer is a, a very good example where people have tumors in their neck right next to um, very important nerves and other structures. And we've been doing conventional radiation and then more conformal radiation and now are starting to look at proton therapy in right. here. But even so, those nerves are often very close or actually encased in the tumor and there still may be late effects. Um, we need to look at it's it, but soon. we need to be, well, no, I, it, it's not too soon to start doing it. And no, start it's too doing soon to know the long-term too, effects. Too, too soon to know the long-term effects. This is a great segue. Managing patient and family expectations. Okay, well, I love to hear that doctors take the time to explain exactly what the procedure is. It doesn't happen all the time. Uh, sometimes something's lacking, but I think the medical professionals to recognize that for most people, oncology is a whole new language, that it's very difficult to understand. So to take the time, what are the benefits of this? What are the risks of this? For um, the family to be able to support what the person with cancer decides to be the treatment is very important. To listen rather than to give advice, um, you know, making suggestions as to the treatment that somebody should follow. It's sometimes um, a challenge to say, to let the person with cancer kind of lead the way as to the treatment that they are comfortable with. How about if that patient says, I can't do it, lead the way for me? That's okay. But a family member has to step up and do that. I mean, he or she, the patient, has to have that advocate, that quarterback, I mean, right? Absolutely, and it's wonderful for if a patient can be their own advocate, but if they're not, and it happens, right. that they have, uh, what we call it is, you know, assembling your team, who's on your team. And what about if they're disagreeing? I mean, you have family members who disagree. Well, I don't know what that proton therapy is. I've never heard of it, I don't want to do it. I mean, you got those issues. I don't know if you had that, but, and I'll come back to you, but that's important stuff, and don't you need professional help to facilitate those dialogues? Absolutely, and that's why the doctor, again, having people in on the family, friends in on the appointments with the doctor, second set of ears, uh, to take notes, writing down questions for the appointments. Preparing. Absolutely, preparing questions for every appointment. That makes you the best advocate that you can be for yourself. But again, there are some people who are not able to take the reins, and they do need family or friends to help them through. Sorry, for, were you mm -hmm. the quarterback? Well, to an extent. A um, couple minutes left, go ahead. Sure, my, my mother helped me immensely. She had, um, you know, she had gone through cancer treatments with my grandmother. So that she had advised me, she said, you really should, should go for the treatments. Uh, but this was before she knew about the, the, the proton advancements. My wife helped me immensely as well. You know, with, she came up with more questions than I did, you know, about uh, long-term effects and, right. and, and all the follow-ups and, and all the other things that were needed that I just wasn't thinking about at the moment. Was it a team? Yes, most definitely. A, a family team, yes. Takes that, doesn't it, finally, doctor? A team. It takes a team. It takes a team on the provider side. Uh, it takes a team on, on the patient side. Eric's wife was there pretty much for every appointment, every treatment. Um, and I think it, it, the bigger picture here is that we have these tools, we have these gadgets, but they're one, they're one tool in the toolbox for, for, for us. And knowing when to invoke this tool versus that tool is a part of what we do. Uh, and 
Uh, and a part of, I think, what we take some pride in, sort of what we, what we do at the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey and, and at Robert Wood, is that everything is not a nail. We're not folks with a hammer and everything looks like a nail to us. Um, it's, it's very important to just understand what the, what the options are and just do the right thing for the patient. I mean, it sounds kind of obvious, but uh, that's, that's really our, our, our mission. This is uh, an important conversation. We do a lot of healthcare and medical programming in the series, on the series, and people know that who watch us on a regular basis, but I learn something new every time, and uh, you have not disappointed us. I want to thank you all for joining us and making a meaningful difference in the public discourse. Thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, New Jersey Resources, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, Berkeley College, New Jersey Sharing Network, and by MagnaCare. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Seeing science in action makes students realize they can learn. What is that organelle called? Elizabeth. With the right tools, it's easy to motivate students. Students need to know science to succeed in the global economy. That's why NJE established the Center for Teaching and Learning. To give teachers the training to make science come alive and to keep New Jersey schools among the best in the nation. That's why we are so proud to teach in New Jersey's public schools.